feel the bill you learn about tonight and make some changes or lose that battle and wait for another year for it to come again. And by then, who knows what's going to happen. So that's why we're here before you. And if you have a group that want us to kind of share our thoughts on this and, and information, we can have to come. And we have these uh, little handouts about, you know, the quick, quick notes version of what you can do, who you can write, um, where you can go. So I'm going to turn this over to the stand to talk a little bit about the Sierra Club. The end of the sixth year period. The start of the legislature cycle. Once, once, once it starts, things happen. Very well. As you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you to Upcountry Sustainability. I think Mahit and I are both grateful for this. We, we kind of bumped elbows at the same meeting in August and we went, gosh, you know, somebody better sort of like start getting the, the troops educated here because it's going to take people to get this word out. Um, my name is Lucy Antinetti. I've been activist with a couple of different organizations, but I've served as an officer, uh, chair, and other officers statewide uh, for the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club is one of the few organizations in Hawaii that actually has full-time person tracking what the legislature is doing. And he's very busy. He's our director, Robert Harris, and he's an attorney, so he's a very uh, smart guy. And I remember in 2011, Robert calling me and saying, oh man, the state is making it through and there's nothing we can do. It's like, it was one bill about one thing and now it's a bill about something else and the comment period is closed and we, could, we wouldn't have enough time to get enough people down to comment. So we don't know what to do. We're gonna to have to hope that during the rule making that we can make this sort of an accountable thing. This was the Public Lands Development Corporation. So I'm gonna share a few slides with you about um, where this began. What sort of, you know, it's very, very broad powers and very, very vague language. And usually things like that don't accomplish what they intended to do. I, I see Gladys nodding here. She's seen a few <laughs> things like that. <laughs> so without further ado. Um, and, and on the intent of raising money for BLNR, although they're cash strapped and they're, they're definitely in need of that, we don't believe this is the way. Quite frankly, if you look at the larger projects that they want to do, if you think about it, do you think that money is going to show up magically in their budget for 2013, 2014? No. So aside from the $100 filing fee for someone who wants to propose a project, I, we can't detect any cash going into DLNR soon enough, safe enough, and adequately enough. So to that point, you know, we, we really would challenge this idea of it will create money for a cash strap department. Clearly, it's just not the way, as you'll see. So we want to talk a little bit about the PLDC, and we still laugh about how the first two words are public land, um, followed by development. Uh, but That's where it started. <laughs> That's exactly where it started. Last year, this is actually two years ago, coming January, but last year, the Senate had a bill that came through. Out of this idea, by Senator Mama Solomon and Senator Donovan de la Cruz, which um, you probably know by now, is a master cracker of this bill. They, they start, it started on the Senate, and it was known as Senate Bill 1555. And it was you know, pretty quiet, everyone agreed, the other not needed money, let's look at something. The original version even included representation by the neighbor islands on the so-called power board. And eventually it got deleted in a fast switch. 23 days later, it made its way to the House, major revisions including removal of neighbor island representation for the five member board, four of which have no cultural history experience background. They're all actually finance, finance people, which is red flag number one for us. But there was a lot of movement uh, that went through the House and Senate pretty quick. And before you know it, it showed up on the uh, Finance Committee, and they, along, <coughs> because it's a committee, but have and say, you know, uh, our old Joseph is trying to unsee. But House Speaker Calvin Say allowed for a waiving of the 48-hour rule. So in essence, it gave the public, whether you're in Hana or Haleiwa or anywhere else or in the Hui, you only had 115 minutes to hustle on over there and raise your objection. <laughs> so, of course, Gary Hoosier, who is, you know, a former senator himself, waved the second red flag and said, wait, 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 what do you mean? It's can't wave and they did. So 115 minutes. And we're not making this up. They're all re records. You know, he actually went into research, tracked it, 
down to when these things made its way through the legislature. So already, you know, we know this is a good, but most of us are pretty dormant. We just don't know this is happening because this is 2011 of last year. Eventually what happens is it makes its way through and it lands on Governor Abercrombie's desk. And as you know, he can sign, a, sign it into law or let it become law. So in a very rapid manner, it got signed into law. It lies dormant for a while. And now, here we are in 2012. And in 2012, the LBC takes it out and says, well, we want public comment. And those were the meetings in August. They went to every major community or every major <coughs> island except for Lanai. So Lanai said, well, how come we're not included? But we never got an answer to no that. Public no public lands. No public lands. And the interesting part above with that is that as they were going around to, to get public input on what is known as the administrative rules, the rules that will help them govern and move and maneuver their way through their uh, authority and power, they were already in discussions with public lands. In July, in fact, Lord, Mr. Haraguchi, Lord Haraguchi, the executive director, had already met with two organizations, two potential developers, to talk about prime farmland on Oahu. Prime farmland being used currently now. And in July, he met with two, he met with a group called the Relativity, Relativity Video, as well as Actus Land Lease. One to create workforce housing, and one to create a sound state studio. So they were already in discussions of Japan before July. They had no rules. They're they already no discussing rules. projects. They have not no. had the full authority, but they're already in motion. So we started paying attention because it was becoming a little too quick under the radar. By the time it came to us, the public, we had a lot of questions, including the public meeting we had. Let me jump in here. Uh, Hugh Starr reminded me that the very first um, uh, incarnation of this bill was only really about the Alibi um, uh, Boat Harbor and one other small harbor. Uh, uh, yeah, on Oahu. And then it just sort of morphed into a million acre deal on public lands across the state. And as we all know, um, our public lands are mostly on the neighbor islands. Most of the public lands are, you know, How did the county. public lands become public lands? Well, as it says here, most of the public lands were lands once owned by the monarchy and the people of Hawaii. And so there's still, you know, there's still really debate over whether they were legally, ever legally transferred to anybody. But this bill is just like moving forward to say, uh, look, we have these partnership opportunities with people. I, I had a personal um, uh, presentation by Senator Dela Cruz, and he was so proud. He said, look, we have this park here that no one's doing anything with, and we could do wonderful things with it. We have a private group that wants to come in and build cabins and build a restaurant and build this and build that. And it was interesting because at the same meeting, there was a citizens, a couple of citizens there that said, you know, we have a nonprofit group that's been working with the same park for years. And the DLNR will never give us a lease to do anything there. It's like, why all of a sudden from some corporation, you're all interested in doing something, but a local community group that wanted to invest funds here, you just kind of pushed out of the way. It, it just, it didn't make a lot of sense. So a lot is at stake here now. We, we have McKenna State Beach, we have all of the Hawaiian and homelands. Everything in light green or dark green there are public lands in South Maui. Um, if you go on to um, uh, East Maui, thousands of acres of our rainforest, and you can see a lot of lands along the coast here, too. So someone might just think, wow, that'd be a nice place for a resort. Uh, Upcountry, we have Hawaiian homelands. We have our, our wonderful state forest reserves at Poli Poli. Uh, we have our Makawao State Forest Reserves in here. Uh, once again, a lot at stake. And then uh, in Central Maui, a lot of um, the uh, areas that were, uh, these are our watershed areas, above Haiku and above uh, Coelho, and these were all you know, crown lands, and the, they're really the basis of the water supply for that country. Um, you know, what if someone came along and a Chinese firm and offered uh, to pay more than A and B and lease them and extract water. It's like, would we have a say? 
course, the answer is no. And we need to do something about this bill. I'm handing it back. <coughs> this is actually what the bill itself looks like. And its, it's description is a 32, you see on the top right corner, it's a 32 page document. But essentially, you know, it, it allows for a, a law, this law will allow, the Tony's law, Act 55, once it was signed, Senate Bill 1555 became law. And it's known as Act 55. It allowed their, it gave them the authority to take the initiative and use their scope of authority and define and determine which public lands would bring the most opportune commercialization revenue generating projects to help DL and R. That is the full stroke of what they can do. And that's the biggest fear that we have. So five member <coughs> board, which I'm looking at right here, right the uh, fairly financed people, I think I mentioned that. Um, their chair is the director of finance, uh, Carol Young. Uh, and they also have, is that William? I know, William's over here. Yeah, on the far end. Yeah. So this is the lady from DBED. The deputy director of DBED, Department of Business Economic Development. And two appointees, both uh, one a former developer, real estate model, logo, and one an attorney, Bobby Bunda, former legislator. So none of them have the, if they're sitting around a circle or a table at a board meeting, a project comes up to them and says, how much can it make us? That's what drives the decision making, and that's the fear. Their decisions are not, their priority, their authority, their interests is not to protect or preserve, but to seek out what the inventory of lands are, what could be the most revenue generating for that purpose, to give the money back into the state. I want to point this out because this is the, a portion of the administrative rules. After we met in August, they got heat. Almost a thousand people on all the items, you know, combined, came and practically threw the boat at them. So they said, all right, we'll, we'll consider it. They and many people had like specific suggestions yes, about their rules. That a lot of people, you know, just said, oh, we don't like this, this is terrible. But there were people who did their homework and said, you should change this paragraph, you should make the rules different this <coughs> way. And Mahina was one of them, but did they listen? Uh, no. What was interesting is that in the original administrative rules proposed that we saw in August, if you read it through, almost throughout the document was peppered the word developer, 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 developer. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not anti-development, but I'm anti-stupid. <laughs> so, and I don't appreciate someone defining what that is for a community and how to live in it. And that's where we were going down that road. Now, I want you to see what they did. They changed every word that said developer into something called project, proposed, entrepreneur. They, they softened it to the degree that it took out what they thought was going to get people's uh, hair raising. They keep insisting there was community input. They, they will retain it, maintain it, commit to it. And yet, and yet, and yet it says, on the third underscore line, on the far right, at least one public meeting in the community of Fesco. One. Just one. So the process is, someone will come to them with a proposal, pay $100, which used to be $500, but somehow it changed. It's a $100 fee now. They turn in their financials, do a nice form, make sure that they have the background for it, the board, uh, the executive director, Mr. Harabushi, reviews it to see if it meets the minimum of what they want. It gets recommended to this five member board. The board asks its questions, are you sure you're solvent? Are you sure you can make money? Whatever, whatever. You're required to have one public meeting. Go to Wailuku, let's say it's gonna be EL Valley you know, Park. So go to Wailuku, have your one meeting. It ends up being on a day that of course, you know, some of us can, some of us can't. They fulfill the requirement of one meeting. Beyond that, you are invited <coughs> email your concerns, fly to Honolulu and attend a board meeting, or mail them a letter. That's the extent. Once that process is completed, the board in its own decision-making powers will have the authority to approve a project. And that's how rapid something can change in our community. Um, has, it, uh, has any, uh, anything have gone through yet? No, no, they were caught. They, they were, they were negotiating. 
trying for an animal. So they backed off of that. How do you stop public officials from rhetoric? I mean, like right now, a lot of people had no knowledge to do. A lot of people had only one hour or whatever it was to get to there. How do you officially stop rhetoric? I, in my personal opinion, I think one is um, hold your feet to the fire when you see it, when you see it rear its ugly head. Is there a standard to hold your feet under the fire? It's the public standard. It how about, how about using due process, which is a recommended rule under every state under federal compliance? Why don't we use that? Well, they're supposed to follow sunshine laws. There's there a requirement. Well, if they're not fulfilling state. their obligation under federal law, Every citizen in this state has the right to turn any official in on, on lack of due process. State is exempted from sunshine law, so they can meet anything yeah. they want. They're, They're not like us. 48 hours. Yeah. No, but it's not true. They